Hi everyone, it's Marla. Welcome back to Twin Astrology. Glad you could join me today. Um, a couple of weeks ago in one of my videos, I talked about CPTSD and emotional flashbacks. And I asked if anyone wanted more information and a lot of you did. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more today. And I have my friend, Teresa Blackburn here to help me. And how I'm seeing this is, I'm going to talk about this from a more broad perspective, um, our multidimensionality, how past lives might play into this, how triggers with your twin might play into these types of issues. And Teresa is going to give us more of a therapeutic type background on this. So let me introduce her. Hi, Teresa. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Good. Can you tell everybody about yourself? Yeah. Hi, my name is Teresa Blackburn and um, I am a licensed professional counselor. Um, I also do energy work, um, teach Reiki classes and do emotion code therapy. So my practice is a blend of more holistic modalities. And um, I still do the regular therapy, but I also like to incorporate those extra energy therapies into my practice with people who are open to it. Um, and I teach Reiki classes sometimes, not a lot, but sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's why I really thought about you because you take this holistic approach. So when I kind of brought this up to you and I mentioned how CPSD could be something that we can carry with us from incarnation to incarnation, that was something that resonated with you. That's probably not looked upon by most um, counselors or psychologists today. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it helps to do the emotion code practice. So sometimes when I'm looking for root causes of something, especially if it's very subconscious or into the cells of the body and the body has the memory. So if you're, you know, for example, if somebody was abused before age four, um, they, they might not have the conscious memory, but it's still trapped in the body and the body and the subconscious have that memory. So as I'd be looking through emotion code, trying to find the root cause of someone's problem currently in their lives, I will find something that happened young, or I'll ask, you know, are there any past life traumatic shocks attached to this? And I'll get a yes or a no. <clears throat> and so then I noticed that sometimes there seems to be no rhyme or reason for what somebody's experiencing now. And then we really look at past life stuff in that case. Yeah, I think this is really important. And, and I've been doing um, past life regressions for a couple of years. And I can tell everybody that every single person that I regress is going back to some kind of trauma that they've experienced. Very mm -hmm. few people go back to a life that was blissful because that's that's not what you're needing to deal with so you know i i want to have people that might be watching that might feel like well i don't think that i have cptsd i don't know what this video could do for me but i think that we can touch on a couple things that could help anybody in any kind of healing when they're dealing with some type of trigger absolutely yeah because cptsd is you know, adding the word complex onto regular PTSD. And people are like, well, what's that mean? And there's a lot of information out there about it. Um, so we're going to talk about what that means, you know, in, in terms of a professional diagnosis and, and, and all the things that that can encompass. But essentially, it's, it's definitely meaning emotional instability or emotional dysregulation. Mm -hmm. And so the emotions being the, the, the meat and potatoes of it. Yeah. Well, why don't you go ahead and like, can you tell people a little bit about what CPTSD is? Yeah. Um, so it, regular PTSD, everybody has heard about, you know, that the soldier that goes to war and they experience death and trauma and they come back and they have, and they're jumping and they're afraid of noise and crowds. So, you know, you, you hear about that. You hear about the big traumas like rape or kidnapping and, you know, deaths and, you know, a lot of horrible natural disasters, things like that. So that, I guess that it's, it's a preconceived notion that, oh, those are the only things that are trauma, or those are the only things you can get PTSD from. But the reason why I think they started on this complex PTSD was because they wanted to encompass other traumas that who are we to decide what is traumatic to the human being, mm -hmm. to the mind, body or not. It could be something very simple. And 
uh, unrecognized by professional standards or the you know, medical models. So that's why I like to be that non westernized type of therapist because I take all things into consideration. So this is like, isn't CPTSD a little bit of a controversial theory now still? In the yeah, it is. And it's not like in the DSM-5. Um, they'll, they'll label it different things. So it's, yeah, it's not in the medical accepted completely into that medical standard model yet because they don't have enough research. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think that we've seen enough to know that it's happening. But the biggest thing with uh, the CPTSD is the emotional flashbacks. You know, so you you have what's a flashback is typically oh I'm a flashing back to like a war zone, but you are essentially flashing back to that. You may not consciously realize it; it may be subconscious. But you, all of a sudden, you're just feeling these emotions, overwhelming emotions that seem to be unexplained, and it seems to be no trigger at all or a very small trigger. But yet you're in this whole full reaction. And you can go into, you know, the four Fs at fight, flight, fawn, and freeze. And your body can go into all types of different, uh, you know, dysregularities. Mm -hmm. I think like a very important piece here is the emotional flashbacks. And this is what my spirit guides led me into on how I even came up with, with finding out about all this stuff, because we're at this place now um, we'll say for the divine feminine and what we're healing, where we're really having to deal with wounds that are um, much more subconscious mm -hmm. than the ones we've been dealing with up till now. So one of the ways for us to tune into what is subconscious for us is to begin to understand our emotions and where we are emotionally in every moment of the day. And if you're having some kind of reaction like going deeper into that reaction. So you might be having an emotional flashback and you don't know about it. And, and isn't one of the signs of complex post-traumatic stress is that there is no distinct trigger like you have with the normal post-traumatic stress. Like you said, the war veteran. So if they hear a loud noise or something, then they go right back to that. But for somebody that has this more complex issue, they're getting triggered and they're not aware of it because there is no, mm -hmm. there's no one thing. Yeah, absolutely. And then it can create it show up as a uh, personality disorders. And one of the things that it's been known to show up like is borderline personality disorder. And boy, if you start reading about that, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I hope this isn't me. Um, because the description of it in the DSM can be really scary. You know, they talk about suicidal thoughts and, you know, cutting and, you know, all, all these heavy things. But then if you read into it a little bit more, it does talk about, you know, emotional instability and having emotions for days at a time. And then all of a sudden switching out to a different type of emotion or emotions just seemingly popping up out of nowhere. But it, there's a lot of um, argument on that right now, as far as what is BPD or my personality disorder and what is CPTSD. So that's all being worked out still, I think in the mental health system. Um, so it can appear as such, it can also appear as narcissistic traits too. So, um, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a blurred line that we're trying to figure out. And it makes me wonder too, has empaths like this can all get so convoluted. And I talked about, you know, how we're, we're star seeds. We come here and we are, we're ultra sensitive people to start with. Okay. So like when we're small um, and we're ultra sensitive, it doesn't take much to create a traumatic experience in a child. It just takes like feeling out of control or feeling shamed or, you know, um, feeling powerless these things can create some kind of emotional reaction that becomes some kind of trigger for us down the line mm -hmm. absolutely and it, it's almost like a habit your brain and your subconscious is a go-to and sometimes it's felt physically you know you, you may feel the physical before the emotion and sometimes the emotion before the physical it just depends on that individual but yeah you can be right into that immediately because the brain automatically makes a connection back to the first time that you felt shame. Um, and it could be around anything as simple as like bathroom usage. I mean, it, it really, it doesn't take 
a huge event to create that connection. But once the connection is made, you're going to these things without even consciously having any awareness of it. Right. And this is what I talk about when I'm talking about people's moons and astrology, because all these things, these are our patterns. These are how we develop these habits and triggers that we're all trying to conquer. But going back to a minute for what I was saying about being an empath, just a few weeks ago, when, when all this stuff was being shown to me more, I was just sitting here on my couch, enjoying my quiet morning by myself. And um, I like to play this um, Chopin music. And I was perfectly happy. I was journaling. And then I started thinking about this music, which is connected to a past life for me. And all of a sudden I noticed like how, like I just immediately got depressed and started crying and stuff. So I switched completely from being perfectly happy and enjoying myself into some other kind of emotional reaction. And then I had to bring myself out of it because that wasn't, I'm not sure if that's the same thing that we're talking about here as emotional flashback. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Teresa? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely one example for sure. Um, you have the awareness of the past life. If I think it, if someone does not have the awareness of it, then they would not know what the heck was going on. They would be like, oh my gosh, how did I get in this mood? What happened? And so, yeah, I think awareness, the more awareness that you have into past lives and all of your you know pasts in this life, the, the more equipped you are to recognize that and be able to attempt to shift out of that space. And then sometimes, you know, it doesn't happen that quickly. You just can't just shift out of that space. So uh, I don't know how long it took you to get back out of that. Um, it didn't into- take long. It took me like, you know, 15 minutes or something. Mm-hmm. But I That's was so surprised, bad. like even when I was having thoughts about that life, for example, I wasn't having sad thoughts. Like I tended to be thinking more of the happier thoughts because I remember playing that song on the piano and stuff. And so that all seemed happy. That's why I was so surprised that a minute later I was crying. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually crying, not just feeling the sadness, actually having the tears too. Yeah. 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 And that's what we're talking about when we say CPTSD. We're not talking about a fleeting emotion that just oh, I felt sad for a second. You know, we're talking about actually feeling something very substantially. And, yeah. you know, so, a lot of people don't know why. And, and they're just in this realm of, you know, confusion because they don't understand it. Yeah, that's maybe not the greatest example, guys. We can maybe talk some different examples. Do you want to share your example that you shared with me, Teresa? Yeah, mine is more the, I would say more of the intense um, phobic type of response or is a physiological response, but it's nonetheless is a thing. So, um, you know, in my experience, since I've been a kid, I haven't had any rhyme or reason for not liking small spaces or to feel enclosed or trapped. Nothing happened to me when I was little, zero issues with that. Um, so I noticed throughout the years that I could not stand to feel boxed in, whether it be in traffic when there's cars on all sides or you know whether it be in a bathroom with no windows um even in those gas station bathrooms when the doors shut behind you and they're real heavy you're like oh my gosh am i gonna get out of here so anything that brought that on for me created a, a, an emotional flashback and i just my body would start to shake and sweat and i'd panic so panic fear anxiety dread you know those emotions started to surface and would be there and i'm like oh my gosh you know I, and I would try to talk myself down and, you know, try to consciously say, oh, everything's fine, but I didn't understand where it came from. And then I had a past life reading with someone and actually three people, and they didn't know each other. And all three alluded to the same thing. And I was like, well, three people can't be wrong. So I was like in a plane um, and then it crashed and I was stuck in it. And I was some kind of soldier of a sort. And then the other opposite opposing force found me and then put me into the ground, which was some kind of underground prison. And then I ended up dying down there in like horrible ways. So that's very claustrophobic from the plane to the underground. And when I heard about that past life reading, I could feel it all again in that moment. I was like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. So I knew then where it came from. So I had to then work on that, um, which I had already been doing, but it helped. 
it helped to know and then it helped to, to work on things in the present. Yeah. Um, I'll share something um, from my life too, a different thing. So I had, I was in a relationship with someone and it was coming to the end, but I started becoming more and more aware of how much this person triggered me. Like every time they would come around, I would have these feelings of anxiety, even though like this was a person that I loved and I couldn't really understand it. But um, I, I was like, I would feel their judgment. Like this person just had to look at me and I would go into, oh my God, I'm doing something wrong. This person's going to be unhappy with me. And this was not a person that, you know, was abusive to me, I would say, you know, they might make backhanded comments and things like that to me. But it, it began to be very stressful. And it was around that same time I was working with my inner child. And she said to me, like, I don't feel safe here. Because I was like asking my child, why are you upset all the time? I don't feel safe here. And I had never really connected you know, the anxiety that I was feeling to actually feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. But I know like in a past life, when I started delving deeper with this person, this person had been abusive to me and even killed me in other past lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So there was something about me feeling pressure, like they were going to be upset with me. Yeah, which would ultimately lead to your death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's the part of it too, is we all, it's, it comes down to that like death anxiety that somehow we're going to be destroyed or, you know, something terrible is going to happen to us. And both of the situations we just talked about, that's, that's what we're afraid of ultimately is the death. And it seems completely irrational. It's just the bathroom or it's just this person that, but you know, it can connect strongly to those past life experiences and our souls kind of, you know, are experiencing that right there in the moment. Yeah. And I think it's um, going back to the emotions. This is how we begin to really repress emotions because you can't make logical sense of your emotions. You feel the way that you feel. Mm -hmm. You know, when I work with people and we talk about their childhood trauma, it doesn't have to be objective. It was your experience. Mm -hmm. And you have to honor the way that you experienced that. So um, you, you've got to stop repressing the things and, and start to go into the emotional self, which can be hard. Mm -hmm. And scary. And that's the, the thing I see the most, even just regular therapy, you know, we're talking, you know, conscious, conscious stuff, you know, nothing to do with past life. You know, one of the things I see the most is avoidance of emotion. And it's almost like the emotion is the scariest part. And one of the, I just throw, throw out an example, I'll, I'll see people, people please, in order to not feel guilt. And, and so they'll do anything to desperately avoid feeling guilt. Um, or I'll see the opposite. I've seen this in, in men a lot of the times where I'll, I'll, they have to have guilt because if they let go of the guilt, then they'll be wrong, bad. They'll do bad. They'll do wrong. And so the guilt is keeping them in line. So I, difference between masculine and feminine can be pretty drastic. Mm -hmm. So that's also something to keep in mind when we're talking about twin flames and things like that. It's like, there is a big difference on those emotions and how uh, masculine and feminine can handle them. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So one of the ways that I got pulled into this was just trying to go into like what's called emotional literacy and trying to understand my emotions um, and a lot of times we just clump all our emotions together. Like mm -hmm. I'm depressed. Yeah, that's it's my like favorite. A lot, does it? <laughs> right. It says somebody will come in and they'll say, I have depression and anxiety. And I'm like, mm. well, then they own it too. They'll say my depression or my anxiety. And the first thing I'll tell them to do is stop owning it. Do you want this gift? You know, do you want to keep it? And I'll say like the, ex I'm experiencing depression and anxiety. We're not owning that. So that's like step one and to try to heal the whole thing. But, you know, it is clumped in those things. So like, what is it? So that's why I like the emotion code chart because it breaks it down and I can look at a bunch of emotions on paper 
And I'll sometimes show it to people and be like, which ones of these are you experiencing? Sometimes they have no understanding of it. I don't know. I'll say, I don't know. I don't I even recognize what that emotion is. I try to push it so far away that I don't even know what that is. And then after a while, you'll still, like you said, you become more literate. Like what actually is the difference between sadness, depression, you know, sadness, depression, grief, um, anxiety, nervousness, worry, because there are differences and there's different frequencies and vibrations for those emotions. Yeah. And I was really surprised. I mean, I don't, I don't think of myself and the has, um, I thought I was emotionally literate, but then when I sat down and I was like, okay, I'm feeling this, but what is this? Like take, you know, I think one day I was feeling anxious. So I tried to break it down and it was really quite hard to mm -hmm. pinpoint where this feeling of anxiety was coming from. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll have a lot of people that are way out of touch with it. Tell me the, the reason. And I'll say, how do you feel? You know, what's the feelings? And they'll say, well, I feel like things should be different. Or I feel that this is happening because, and I'm like, that's not how you feel. That's what you think. Those are beliefs. And there's a difference between emotion and belief. And I'm like, what about the feeling? How do you feel? And then sometimes people just be like, you know, <laughs> blank, uh, you know, and, and or you might have one, well, I'm mad. Okay, well, what's under the anger? So then, you know, you have to unlayer the stuff. But yeah. it is, it, it's, and it's, you know, we're not, we want to, subconscious says it's not safe to go into that emotion. Just as you said before, it's not safe. If I go into the abandonment, I'm going to panic. Like that's not safe to even go there. So we're not even going to recognize the abandonment. We're going to disassociate from that. Doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I think you bring up a good point too about like, what do you feel? Because we don't realize that our emotions are very much connected to our body. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, especially when we're highly sensitive spiritual people, we, we don't want to be in our body because there is an emotional connection to being in our body. But if we're not in our body, then we're not fully accessing our intuition too, because a lot of our intuitive abilities come through our body sensations as well. Yeah. And people want to get out of the body because trauma happened in the body. And then it's uncomfortable to have an emotional flashback in the body. Very uncomfortable. You could feel sick or sweaty or like you're going to pass out and you know, a numerous things. And we're like, nope, we want to get out of that. So we want to just detach from the body and also disassociate from that emotion. And it's just, that's what creates the loop that that's what CPTSD is then it is essentially this loop that you're in of like having the emotion, not wanting to feel it, disassociating, disconnecting, distracting, avoiding, covering up, escaping, and then boom, you're, you're like, okay, I'm better until the next time it happens. It's not actually sitting in it or facing it, turning around and saying, I'm going to look at you right in the face and we're going to deal with some of these things under the surface because subconscious says it's not safe. Body's like, no, don't want to feel that again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really important though, too. I just want to mention to people, especially if you're in the divine feminine right now, to be grounded. And so I think that's kind of a, a part of this coming up too, because a lot of people, myself included, tend to disassociate. Um, and one of the ways you can disassociate is like leaving your body or going into a type of trance, whether that's through like music or sleeping or watching TV or meditating. Um, these can all be ways of, of escapism. So yeah, with the, with the way things are shifting with the masculine and feminine and the masculine is more in the 5D right now. And so it's important for the divine feminine to be more grounded in the 3D to anchor the energy for our partner. But um, so going into that, Teresa, can you talk a little bit about the four F's and yeah, I was just going to say that respond and when we have these emotional flashbacks. Yeah, definitely. It's so important because for a while it was just fight or flight. You know, people typically even still say that that's your fight or flight response. Your sympathetic nervous system essentially is what's being triggered. And so then that's why you feel the physiological stuff, the increased heart rate, you know, and all that different stuff physiologically that we talk about, but fight, flight, and then there's freeze and then there's fawn. And, and I know a lot of people aren't familiar with freeze and fawn. 
So, you know, we can talk about uh, fight or flight are a little bit obvious. You know, you either want to get the hell out of there and run from the situation. You want to flight. You want to fight where, you know, you get argumentative or, you know, you put your, your dukes up. You're like, yes, I want to fight this out. Or then there's freeze where it's like, there's nothing. You, you can't talk. You can't respond. You can't move. Get out of the situation, but you can't do anything in the situation to fight. It's just like, mm, like a moment of frozen. And in an argument, let's just say it's not a physical um, threat, but in an argument with somebody, that's called shutting down. It's like, oh, you just shut down on me. You'll hear someone say, well, no, you froze because you have no idea how to respond or how to be because that was your trauma response in the past. Um, and that's the safest for you. Fawning is a lot of different circumstances um, where you kind of just, you might appease someone. You, you know, you might, it, let's, it's a common example. You know, a guy pressuring a girl into, you know, something sexual that she doesn't want to do or, you know, feeling like she kind of needs to a please, please him or appease him in order to get her safety needs met or, you know, feeling like she can get out of the situation safely. So, you know, there are a lot of different examples of that, but that's when you kind of, you know, you play into it, you play into it just to keep yourself safe. And I think I see a lot of that in movies. It's portrayed a lot in movies, people doing that, um, women doing that, especially just to be able to keep themselves safe. I don't know if you have an example that you've seen for uh, freeze or fawn that you like to share too. Um, well, the interesting thing is that I didn't know, I, I never heard of freeze or fawn. And so when I started learning about this stuff, I knew about fight and flight, obviously. And I would have said, you know, my primary reaction to stuff would be more flight orientated. But then when I heard about freeze and fawn, like this big light bulb went off and I realized that I was into this more than I ever thought I was because mm. those tend to be my, my strongest reactions to something, especially freeze mm -hmm. would be a big one. But I think a lot of um a lot of people that have strong codependency issues they do that because they're fawning mm -hmm. and they're afraid that the other person isn't going to accept them or whatever and so they're they're trying to stave off some kind of abandonment by keeping the other person pleased mm -hmm. absolutely it's huge in people pleasing codependency um you know uh, not being authentic and true to your own thoughts and feelings you know, kind of waiting on what the other person's going to do and, you know, saying, oh yeah, I go along with that. And, you know, well, what do you want? You know, not, not having a strong understanding of self. And that's also with borderline personality and, you know, uh, the, the other personality disorders that are in that cluster B along with CPTSD is that, that um, unsurety, that lack of clarification on the self. And, and so that, that is huge. And, you know, people that are like that will more easily be in that fawn space easier and in past life if you think about it i mean imagine being asked if if you were a, a witch you know or, or something that happened in the past you're like no i'm not you know, i'm gonna do like you would have to cover up a, a lot of the times with that fawning and you know just ever thinking about anything that could happen in the oh the centuries past with past life just reminds me a lot of fawning because it's it was a thing that a lot of people had to do in order to just keep alive and if you were in a female body, you definitely had to fawn because you had no rights. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Not, not, that's just outside of like all the witchcraft stuff and, and things that happen to women, but just like you are basically sold from one man to another man. Yeah. And then men, I see this in men because um, I do do a lot of practice with men because I'm a pretty masculine um, blend <laughs> on that scale there. Um, so I see it and happen with them because and it's it's interesting, you know, I never, people don't think this, you know, I have a guy who's, you know, popular and tough and all this stuff and appears very masculine, but, you know, he does fawn when it comes to saying no to sex with women because he had been abused by another man at a very young age. So it's like, he doesn't know how to say no either. And he kind of mm -hmm. pleases around and fawns around it too. But we don't look at that men as that. And we don't even think that that is excusable sometimes for them. And so we just have this misconception that how that shows up in men too. But I see it all the time. I see the freeze. Yeah, I think it, it might be, because if we think about from like a male perspective, how about like if you're with a partner that is very demanding 
and like they've got their chore list that you have to do or something. And I mean, how many men do we see? They just, they don't argue. They don't stand up for themselves. They just kind of go along with whatever their spouse wants. Even when it comes to like, you know, what are you going to do for the day? And, and the other person is making all the decisions that, yeah. that can happen. And maybe yeah. that's a bit too of checking out. And you can have these, these multiple reactions. They're not, you have one, you have these overlaying multiple reactions, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just that what becomes most popular is the one that causes the physiological response. So if it's panic and it's flight, you, you can tell, you know, so it's more popular or more easily recognized because, you know, you're, you have all the feelings physically that go along with it. Sometimes with the freeze or fawn, it can happen mentally. You don't even really recognize that that's happening. You might not even physically freeze, you might mentally freeze. That's what, what I was talking about in, in that relationship example I gave. I was reacting from freeze and fawn mm -hmm. because I didn't like feeling that anxiety of feeling like I was in some way disappointing or not living up to this person's standards and they were going to like um, belittle me in their mind or something. So I would always try to be one step ahead and make sure that everything was done right. Mm -hmm. You know, so I wouldn't have to feel that kind of or even get that look, that look. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the disapproval look. The disapproval yeah. look. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you could see how then this type of thing can show up in relationships and cause a lot of problems. You know, with couples and relationships, with you know divine counterparts, things like that being triggered. It, it can. It just shows up so often, and it makes it tough. Yeah. So if you're being triggered by your twin, you might want to go into some of this stuff. You might want to try to get to the bottom of the emotion, maybe kind of uh, get a perspective of what reaction you're having, like what F are you in and start to break these things down. This is going to help you become clearer on where you are subconsciously. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I feel like with that, you're going to get so often triggered, especially if you're in the twin situation, you get triggered frequently. And so you have plenty of opportunity and chances to go look in a little bit deeper and be open to what is happening. Not so reactive, not so immediate to say, you know, blaming them or, you know, saying, oh, this situation is at fault here. You know, I need this situation to be different. I need them to change. You know, I need this whole thing to be resolved and then I'll be happy. So it's a matter of like, taking that emotional trigger and the flashback that it puts you in saying, is this an emotional flashback? You know, is this related to maybe something in the past? Is this maybe possibly subconscious or even past life? Or did something happen in the conscious that I know about and I can link this to? And if that's the case, you might link it back even further and further and further until you get to the original root, because that's what we're looking for. And I think that's really important. I mean, that's something I had to do uh, hugely when triggered by my twin over and over again until I was able to really get a, gr a grasp on it. And it happened repeatedly. It wasn't just overnight, just one trigger and it was all. Yeah. I think too, like we have to understand, especially because we're here working templates and all of this thing, all these things that the things that we're dealing with from a past life all the, the trauma that you're needing to clear is going to somehow show up in this life. So these patterns just repeat and repeat and repeat like, okay, I can bring this back to my teen years and then I can bring this back to my childhood, but you could go further because that childhood pattern is actually coming from these past life patterns. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. I like that you described it like that. That's perfect exactly what happens in the therapeutic setting and what I do with people. So we start in the now and then we, we work back and back and back. When normal therapists, it's like, tell me what happened 10, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. No, I want to know now. And then we work back like that. It's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have to know the past life in every situation, mm -hmm. but um, you know, it's, it's easier and easier. The more dimensional, multidimensional we become, the easier it is to tap into this past life stuff. And I think, um, you know, talking about the twin dynamic, 
understanding these things can help us maybe understand our twin a little bit more. So if your twin, for example, is ghosting you, well, maybe that's because they have trauma that you just triggered in them. And now they're going into, I don't know, freeze or flight. Mm -hmm. And they're Absolutely. just shutting down. Yeah. Yeah. It can be looked at from both sides. You know, look at yourself, but also take into consideration them, what's happening with them too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, can you share with us any tips steps or anything further for people that think they might want to know more, do more with this? You know, I was thinking about that um, leading up to this, and I thought of something that I really like. So I, and this is from, I don't know if I can say that, right, from some, another person who recommended something, I can, another author, like she's a pretty famous one, but. Yeah, you can say it. Okay. So, you know, Elon, Elon Van Zant. she's, um, she did Fix My Life um, on Oprah, but she has a lot of books out there and stuff. So she has these six questions that she presented in a Facebook live video um, that I like and that I have adopted into my practice and that when someone is triggered, I'll have them go through these six questions. And so just to run through them real quick, it, it's, I mean, it's, it, you can, you know, people can write this down and go back into the video and, and, you know, mark it down, but I'm gonna go through them quick. So number one is what am I feeling? So right away, what am I feeling? What are emotions? And what am I feeling? Number two, where am I feeling it in my body? I think those are the most two basic, most important questions you can ask yourself when something has shifted. When you've gone into a different energy space or a different emotional space, thought field, what, what am I feeling? Where do I feel it in my body? Number three, she says, what experience does this remind me of? So that's when you can go into, you know, did something similar happen to this in the past? What is this reminding me of? Number four, what am I believing about myself? So that shifts gears just a bit into belief. So having emotion, I feel abandoned, sad, anxious, rejected, mad, frustrated, whatever. But then believing is I feel not good enough, inadequate, wrong, bad, like I'm a bad person. You know, those are beliefs. So then she has you, I'm inferior, whatever the case is. Number five, what has this experience come to teach me? So I like that, you know, I'm, I'm down with getting into maybe to love myself more or to look at patterns deeper, whatever the case is. And the number six is really the most important one. And it's beautiful. It says, if this experience were to never change, like if you can't make this situation any different right now, as we all know with the twin stuff, that's a huge thing. We can't change it right now. So if this were to never change, what do I need to practice in order to regain or maintain peace? And so I'm like, wow, those are phenomenal six questions that I would use in any emotional flashback situation. I love those. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she did some live videos from the beginning of quarantine on every Saturday morning on Facebook. So I just caught a few of them and I was like, that is phenomenal. So that is what I like to people to do on their own. Cause you know, aside from saying, come to therapy, let's dig this up, have therapeutic sessions work some kind of a workbook, um, like, you know, that, that might guide you through some things. Um, you know, of course the breathing techniques, the meditation, the tapping, I mean, there's a million things I could tell people to do, but in that moment, it's so hard to remember to do that. But if you put these six questions in the notes of your phone, or if you have them in front of you and you habitually do this, you question yourself after every trigger, even when it's not extreme, you'll remember the brain is intelligent. The subconscious will put it right on into the system Oh, we have to ask ourselves those six questions and it'll get used to that habit in a second. You have to practice it a few times. And our higher selves want us to get to the bottom of these things. So your higher self will, you know, they'll very easily help you slide into these new habits. Yeah. They'll happen over. It's what seems like overnight or in an instant. I know that if, if that happens to me now, I instantly just go to the questions and I've memorized them. You know, it's, it's, it's like your you they your soul craves it. Your higher self says, "Yes, please do this." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, for me, um, I just want to share with people how I came across this stuff. I follow a guy on YouTube called Richard Grannon. Some of you might know him. He's also known as the Spartan Life Coach. He has some great stuff. He talks a lot about narcissists and things like that. And um, he has a whole separate channel called Richard Grannon fortress 
emotional protection system. And he's got videos in there. We are, he goes more in depth into emotional flashbacks, CPTSD. And then he also gives you some tips um, to working through that. Very similar to what you were talking about, but a little bit different. He has you like focus on each finger with a different thing, like, okay, this is not an emotional flashback. And he talks a lot about taking care of yourself to just stay more balanced in your emotions from the get go, like making sure that you're sleeping right and you're eating right and, um, you know, taking time out, meditating and things like that. So I will link some of his videos down below if people want more information there. And I know a, another book that's helpful that he talks about and other people have mentioned in regards to this. I think you just mentioned it earlier, the book by Pete Walker. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody that feels like you're really, you know, this is really resonating and you've experienced trauma and you think you have CPTSD, you might want to check out his book, which I'll link below too. Awesome. Yeah. And what about you, Teresa, because you um, see clients, do you want to share your information with them? Yeah, um, my, and you can probably link it, but my website is Reiki Therapy Pittsburgh, all one word, dot com. And, um, you know, I also have email, which is just my first name, T-E-R-E-S-A-E-B-3-4 at gmail.com. And um, I think I also just pop up on Google. I, I have a small YouTube channel, you know, I, I do some little things on there too, but um, that, that's about it. And if somebody wants to get a hold of me for sessions, they're all done online over Zoom um, or phone. You know, if somebody's not comfortable, you know, connecting face-to-face -face, and we could do that. And all the energy therapies I do you know, obviously work from a distance as well. Okay, and again, we'll link below for people. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was great, great idea. I love talking about this stuff and I hope it resonates with people and, and it helps them. I'd love to have you back because I think we have a lot of things that we could talk about. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Teresa. And thanks, everybody, for watching. We're sending you all love, and we will speak to you soon.